أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحاب أجمعين عباد الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم وإياي عن عصيانه تعالى ومخالفة أمره يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم من عمل صالحا فلنفسه ومن أساء فعليها وما ربك بظلم العبيد Let us begin my dear brothers and sisters by entering into a state of worship a state of a deeper remembrance of Allah and we do this by emptying our hearts and our minds from all of the thoughts that occupy our minds, all of the emotions that course through our hearts, and enter into a state where we feel peace. When you do this, the one thing that you cannot eliminate, any one that we cannot eliminate, is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is in this sense and this state of inner peace, in a quiescence, but we feel quiet. We then are more sensitive to detecting and feeling and remembering our experiences of bearing witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's in this state of remembrance that we then bear witness and we say, Nashhadu. La ilaha illallah. We bear witness that there is no God but the one God, alone, single, unique, almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, the all merciful, the all compassionate. And we complete this testimony by also bearing witness that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his beloved servant and messenger, who came to really be the instrument of what we, what we have called God's own final composition of faith that brings together the themes of all of the prophets. I urge you, my dear brothers and sisters, as I urge myself, to be mindful of Allah, to be careful in how we think of Allah, and to be mindful of His commandments to us and His prohibitions to us, what He has urged us to do and what He has warned us to avoid. because it is by following Allah's commandments that we have what we hear a lot today in the media, the guardrails of our faith that keep us on the right path, the straight path, what is called Sirat al-Mustaqim, the path that is straight, the path that takes us in the shortest possible way, the most accelerated possible speed to, to achieving the deepest possible relationship with Allah, which is union with Allah, union with His will and with His preference for us. My dear brothers and sisters, today, or this rather this last week, we have been riveted to our television sets, watching what has happened to our nation's capital. We have witnessed the, the, the last days, or I might say the, the dying days, of a president who has sought to divide our nation, the United States of America. As people of faith, as people of, who believe in the one God, who believe that God sent messengers to every community, it is our duty as Muslims to pray for our leadership, to pray that the transition from one administration to the other 
will be as peaceful as possibly can be. And that Allah guide our leaders to what is correct and right. My dear brothers and sisters, as I've shared with you several times this year, this year has, or in the last year rather, in the last 12 months, this is the first time that I began to comment about political events. And the commandment that we have as Muslims is to be instruments of unity, instruments of peace, because our faith Islam is based upon the very word salam, which means peace. It means a submission to God, a surrender to God, a recognition and acknowledgement that we are all creatures of one God. Allah has said in his Quran several times, This your ummah is one nation, one ummah. And I am your Lord, so worship me. When you combine it with the other verses and teachings of the Quran, we develop and evolve an understanding where our faith is really the common denominator of all the faiths, which has brings in the themes of all the faiths. I've even said at one point in time, it is as if Allah himself has uh, composed a faith that combines the themes of all of the faiths. There have been people who have tried to create an interfaith religion, but who can be a better creator of an interfaith religion than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we have to look at our religion as an interfaith religion composed by the creator himself. Now, why do I say this? And, I, and, and why do I say, as I've said many times before, that this nation, the United States, was founded, and if you look at the founding documents of the United States, especially the Declaration of Independence, how it is so much in keeping with the values of our faith, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are equal. The equality of human beings, the fact that in the eyes of God, God does not see us based upon the class or caste divisions that human beings have created divide, to divide themselves. Allah acknowledges in the Quran that he created us from one male and one female and, and formed us into various nationalities and ethnicities so that you would celebrate your diversity, but never, brothers and sisters, to lose sight of the unity that embraces our diversity. And this motto of the unity that embraces our diversity is the very motto of this nation, a pluribus unum, which means from the many, we are one. Or you might say, we are a one, a unity that embraces our diversity. This has been the story of America. And this has been a constant battle that has been waged between those who try to create in the language or in the framing or in the vocabulary, in the phrasing rather, of Abraham Lincoln, that we were a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are equal. And that in spite of the civil war, which occurred in the 1860s, and the reprisal of this, of this civil war, which Donald Trump reprised in what I've called sometimes Civil War version 2.0. The struggle has been between those who wish to emphasize our diversity, to separate people and to be prejudiced against them based upon differences of color, of skin color, differences of class, and all the kinds of differences 
that human beings have created to grant those who have, who share that particular trait to, 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 to have the lion's share of power and of wealth and to deny those who do not share those traits the, their rightful share of power and wealth. In every human society, there has always been these struggle, this struggle. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we look at what happened when this nation was formed, we may be correct in, in saying that their idea of all men being equal was really meant to eliminate the class divisions that existed in European society at the time between the noble class, the class of the king and the nobles, mm -hmm. and those who were denied that. If you look at Europe at the 200 years ago, until actually as recently as a century ago, you would find that those societies, like many societies in the world, were divided into classes, the upper class and the lower class of society. And the Declaration of Independence was primarily targeted, really, to eliminate the classes that existed in European society. So the United States established a society that eliminated those class differentiations, but it did not eliminate at that time the difference. It did not include people of other races. It was to create a greater equality among the white race that still believed and harbored at that time a sense of its own superiority against other societies. But as the story and the narrative of the United States continued, the, the struggle to include people of other faith traditions and other races as part of the American society was a struggle that has been waged over the last couple of centuries. It was a while before Ameri Americans who founded this were primarily white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, what has been called popularly wasps. Catholics were excluded, Jews were excluded. But by the 20th century, by the middle of the 20th century, by the 1950s, 1960s, America gradually included Catholics and Jews as part of their society, but not yet members of other races. The Native American Indians, uh, the Amer Black Americans were still excluded and in many respects are still excluded. But this struggle to create a more perfect union was part of the narrative of this country. When I first came to this country in the 60s, there was a Nobel physicist, William Shockley, who actually believed, as several people did at that time, in the superiority of the white race over the non-white races. And a century ago, if you looked around, when they looked around, they could see, certainly because of the the greater economic power of European countries, the greater uh, military power of those countries, they, they, they could put forth specious arguments over their superiority. But today in America, we can see very clearly, even, even white Americans have realized that there's no superiority of the white race over the non-white races. Gradually over this last century in sports, black Americans have demonstrated their superiority in superior skills when it comes to the sports. They're of, they're of sports. In the halls of academia, Asian Americans have demonstrated their superiority numerically over white Americans. So even white Americans today acknowledge that they have no inherent 
superiority over the non-white races. This notion that all men are equal in the eyes of God is something that began uh, in a more formal way at the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim, Abraham. And all the Abrahamic faith traditions and including our prophet Muhammad, we can see that in Muslim societies and the success of Islam around the world was because of its ability to, 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 to expand the participation within the Ummah of people of all races, of all languages, who believed in the Islamic principles of one Ummah, in spite of our diversity, worshipping one Creator. But Allah demands from us even more. Allah tells us and commands us not to differentiate between his messengers. This is something which even many Muslims have failed to completely assimilate and internalize. How do we, how do we embrace this idea, brothers and sisters, that we do not distinguish between his prophets, between, his mess, between Allah's messengers? It has to include the idea that all the revelations that Allah sent, all the scriptures are our collective heritage. The prophet and his followers had to struggle and fight to exercise their right to practice their own faith. The Quran in, in Surah Al-Kafrun, which almost all of you know and have memorized, commands the prophet to tell the unbelievers that you do not worship whom I worship or what I worship. I do not worship what you worship. And neither of us will, will ever worship what each other worships. So therefore, let's agree to you, your religion, and to me, mine. Allah additionally revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah, La ikraha fiddin, there shall be no compulsion in religion. Allah intends and desires that each of us find our own path to Allah, that we, that it should be, that, that we worship Allah out of our free will. As Allah himself said, if I had wanted to, if we had, we could have made all of you perfect believers, but we did this to test you. Allah wants to test us because it's only when you love God freely of your free will that it has value to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah also commands us more than once. You are familiar with the penultimate verse of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah uh, says, describes the believers as those who say, We do not distinguish between any of his messengers and they say we have heard or we hear and we have obeyed and we obey. But the challenge that many of us have in really internalizing this particular idea of not distinguishing from his prophets is one that many of us find challenging. Now, the, the, the concept of freedom of religion is fundamentally an Islamic idea. This is also an American idea, which, which, which I personally believe that the founders some of whom read the Quran like Thomas Jefferson, had their own copies of the Quran and, 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 and knew about Islam. They knew about Muslims because the two first countries to recognize the United States of America were Oman and Morocco, Muslim majority countries. The Ottoman Empire was still strong at that time. And they saw the multi-religious societies of the Ottoman Empire and how they thrived they knew the history of Islamic societies. Now, Islamic societies from, from the time of Andalusia in Spain, all of North Africa, in Damascus, during the time of the Umayyads, and in, in, in Baghdad, during the times of the, um, of the Abbasids, and, and, and in, uh, in, in India at the time of the Mughals. Uh, these were multicultural societies, multi-language, multilinguistic, multi-religious, 
multicultural in many ways. Um, uh, the, the caliphs of Harun Rashid and, and, and others uh, uh, translated books from all over the world, books of people who were not Muslims, Greek philosophy, uh, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy. They translated all of the books and, and accepted this as their collective heritage. This is what makes societies thrive because when, when, the, when the common knowledge and the common wisdom, the collective wisdom of humanity is, is, is internalized, you become richer, you become wealthier, you become more intelligent, you become wiser, and society becomes more prosperous. And the prosperity of all societies today, whether it is the United States, whether it is Europe, whether it's even China, that, that, that imports and tries to, 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 to quickly uh, bring in and learn all the knowledge and experience in technology, in the sciences, to, 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 to expand their economy and to fast track the growth of their economies are uh, based upon, upon assimilating all the new knowledge as rapidly as possible to, to improve and make their countries more prosperous. So prosperity of a society is a function of its diversity and of its, its embrace of diversity. It's embrace of all of the wisdom, the collective wisdom of all societies. This brothers and sisters is very much a fundamentally Islamic imperative. Now, Allah also tells us in, um, in verses 150 to 152 of Surah An-Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran. I'll, and I'll read the translation and paraphrase it to make it easy to understand. God tells us that those who seek to separate between Allah and his messengers are indeed unbelievers, are kafirun who will therefore receive a painful or humiliating punishment. And in the converse, Allah also adds, whereas those who believe in God, in Allah and in his messengers and do not separate between them. I'll repeat that. Those who believe in God and his messengers and do not separate between them will receive God's rahmah, his forgiveness, his merciful forgiveness and be rewarded positively. Now the only way to fulfill these divine commandments, or one important way rather, at the very least, to fulfill these commandments of Allah is by recognizing that what we call different religions are in many cases different ways that Allah provided humankind to worship him. Different languages, different rituals. Allah says we give to every every society, it's monastic, it's rituals. Therefore, our role and responsibility is to find the common platform that underlies what appears to us as diversity in our beliefs and rituals of worship. This is specifically, brothers and sisters, what the Quran commands the Prophet Muhammad, and by extension, all of us, in verse 64 of uh, Surah Ali Imran, the third chapter, where Allah here commands the Prophet to address the Christians and Jews because at the time of the Prophet, those were the two faiths, or those were the faiths that were extant at that time in the Arabian Peninsula, saying, let us come to a common word between us and you, kalimat in sawa in bananu that namely that we will not worship other than God, that we will not associate anything with him, and not take each other as, as, as gods or as lords, our burden. Now, Allah knows the differences and, and critiques the Jews for their failings and critiques the, 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 the Christians. But the Prophet himself protected the right of Christian monasteries to worship in peace and to be protected in wherever the Muslims ruled and had power. But this commandment to, 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 to communicate and to convey and to request of the Jewish community and the Christian community at his time 
to let us come and agree on a common platform, a common set of ideas on which we will all agree. We have our points of disagreement, but let us find our points of agreement. And what are they? Allah delineates them, that we will not worship other than God and not associate anything with him and not worship each other, not take each other as, as lords. In other words, not have a, a, a superior class system. So this, brothers and sisters, is the assignment that we as Muslims need to step up at this time and this day in this nation, which is to come to a common platform upon the faith communities and then to deploy this platform to build not only a deeper friendship among our faith communities, but to establish our societies as Allah intended them, multi-faith societies, multicultural societies, multi-ethnic societies, multilingual societies, because then we will prosper and thrive. This is how we will celebrate our differences. We do not, we do not judge people negatively because they have you know, different color eyes. Now, you can create a society where those who have blue eyes or black eyes are the, are the gifted class and those who do not have that particular color of eyes. But we do not notice these differences. We notice these differences, of course. Oh, somebody has beautiful brown eyes, blue eyes, hazel colored eyes, black eyes. We know people have different color hair whether it's blonde or brown or black or gray. But we do, not, we do not judge them negatively because of these differences. Why should skin coloring be a difference? It is time for us, brothers and sisters, to make skin coloring be celebrated like we celebrate the different eye color, the different colors of our hair and not make that a reason for denying people their share, their rightful share of power and wealth. This is what our faith teaches us. And those of us who have lived in different cultures know and have experience, and almost all of us here have lived in multicultural societies, multi-ethnic societies, or have lived in more than one kind of nationality in one kind of culture. And we have learned, as I have, that learning other languages, for example, made me appreciate my own language even more. It didn't make me lose my love of my own language. It made me appreciate the relationships that exist between my language and other languages. And I learned to appreciate and celebrate all these languages and also enabled me to glimpse not only what is common but the diversity in how different languages see different aspects of reality or emphasize different aspects of reality. Many of us may feel very down or depressed by what we have experienced this week but brothers and sisters I am extremely confident that America will thrive, that American democracy will survive. And as our great Imam Ali said, educate your children for a future different from your own. And as a look to the past, the past was a time of white supremacy, of white dominance in all the arenas of human endeavor. Today in America and throughout the world, we see other races and other ethnicities and other cultures catching up, and in some cases even running ahead. So let us celebrate our diversity. Let us participate in this. And like many of us, I mean, as many people has, have said, who would have imagined that in the state of Georgia, we have now two senators, Democratic sen senators, that's not so much the issue, but two senators, one black, one Jewish, representing the state of Georgia. This, brothers and sisters, is the future of America. And there will one day be Muslims too. We have Muslims in Congress already. We will have Muslims in senators one day, inshallah. 
and we will be a country that expresses the Quranic celebration of our diversity, a country that expresses the unity and embraces the unity that underlies or, you know, our diversity. That we were created from one male and one female, that Allah evolved us in, into different ethnicities so that we would celebrate these diversities, would appreciate the beauty. I mean, blue eyes are, are, are beautiful. So are brown eyes. So are black eyes. So are hazel eyes. It's Beauty is not a function of color. Beauty is beauty. I have seen people who are black and extremely good looking. People who are white and extremely good looking. People who are brown and extremely good looking. We have seen fantastic, beautiful specimens in all races, in all colors, in all ethnicities. And there's beauty in every language. Every language has its own beauty, its own poetry, its own musicality. And to appreciate the various things that we are is part of being human, my dear brothers and sisters. So let us as Muslims put forth these set of ideas as our Im religious imperatives and highlight how they match and reflect this great country, the United States of America, of which we all are proud to be part of. We recognize parts of our history which we are not proud of, but we are proud of the positive aspects of our history. May Allah bless you all. May Allah bless us. May, may Allah bless our leaders and guide them to the principles that, that not only are have made this country great, have contributed to the greatness of the world, principles that are actually it, fundamental pillars of our faith. I, let us pray, brothers and sisters, that Allah guide us. أقول قالي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم الحمد لله الحمد لله حملا كثيرا كما أمر ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له المتعالي عن المشاركرة المتعالي عن المشاركة والمشاكلة لسائر البشر وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله النبي المعتبر وعلموا أن الله تعالى صلى على نبيه قديما فقال تعالى ولم يزل قائلا عليما وآمرا حكيما تنبيها لكم وتعليما وتشريفا لقدر نبيه وتعظيما إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حامد مجيد ورضى اللهم عن الأربعة الخلفاء السادة الحنفاء المميزين بعده بالرعاية والولاة والاصطفاء ذو القدر العلي والفخر الجلي سداتنا ومولينا وأئمتنا وأئمتنا أبا بكر الصديق وعمر وعثمان وعلي ورضى عن السبتان السعيدين السنان الشهيدين القمرين النورين سر شباب إحل الجنة في الجنة وريحان نبي هذه الأمة الإمام أبي محمد الحسن والإمام أبي عبد الله الحسين وعن أمهما فاطمة الزهراء وعن جدتهما خديجة الكبرى وعن عائشة أم المؤمنين وعن بقية أزواج رسول الله أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابع التابعين وتابعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم الأموات إنك السميع قرب مجب الدعوات يا رب العالمين اللهم وأيد الإسلام وأعلي وانصر كلمة الحق والإيمان 
Allahumma ja'al khayra zamanina akhira wa khayra a'malina khawatimiha wa khayra ayyamina yawma liqa'ik wa rafa'a maqtaka wa ghadabaka anna Allahumma rafa'a maqtaka wa ghadabaka anna Allahumma rafa'a maqtaka wa ghadabaka anna wa tusallit alayna bidhanubina man la yakhafuka fina wa la yarhamna ya rabbal alamin Allahumma aslih ahwalana wa balighna mimma yurdika amalana واختم بالصالحات أعمالنا وبالسعادة آجالنا وتوفنا وأنت راض عنا يا رب العالمين أسأل الله العظيم رب العرش الكريم أن يغفر لي ولكم والمسلمين أجمعين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله العظيم أذكركم وأقم الصلاه